everyone. I am here today with Stefan Spencer, and he is an internationally recognized SEO expert and best-selling author. He is also the co-author of The Art of SEO, author of Google Power Search, and co-author of Social E-Commerce, all published by O'Reilly. The Art of SEO, now in its third edition and weighing in at nearly 1,000 pages, is considered the Bible of search engine optimization and boasts testimonials from such industry giants as Seth Godin and Tony Shea, and is even used as a textbook at universities. Stefan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Awesome, awesome. And today we're going to talk about what on-page and off-page SEO means with today's search engine algorithms and traffic. And I personally am super interested in talking about this and, and learning from the industry giant uh, with Stefan about all this because there's a lot of confusion about what SEO means in today's world based on what it used to do and based on what it means now and love to get a lot of stuff cleared up by uh, by Stefan. So, uh, Stefan, just to kind of get things kicked off, um, just on some basics here, um, can you just talk about just what are the basics every company needs to concentrate on for on-page SEO? Right. So first let's uh, define what goes in the on-page bucket versus what goes in the off-page bucket. Perfect. Because this might be unfamiliar uh, terminology uh, for the listeners. So on-page refers to anything that would be on the page in the code, in the HTML, in, in, on the rendered page um, that fa affects the page in question, whereas off-page would include things that are on other pages of the website or other websites altogether or signals that um, Google pays attention to that are not just directly on the web, but perhaps in um, do domain who is records or um, just kind of a historical rap sheet that they might keep on you and past inf and fractions and, and uh, uh, spammy behavior. So there are a lot of way more off-page factors to think about than on-page, and over time the off-page stuff I think is becoming – more uh, difficult, more elusive for the marketer to figure out because and to, to master, right? It, it's okay. easy to think of the fact that, oh, this is an off-page factor, uh, but it's going to be more elusive to even know what those off-page factors are as we're becoming more um, uh, driven by machine intelligence, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence is becoming a bigger and bigger part of the Google algorithm, and this is going to make uh, SEO and just the Google algorithm altogether just a black box. We're going to have a really hard time even knowing what the signals are. Now we do. Hmm. Now we have a general idea what many of the signals are because machine learning and the rank brain algorithm is what uh, they're using for machine learning right now in, in the algorithm. That accounts for maybe 15% of all searches from what Google engineers are saying, but that's going to ramp up over time. So this is going to get really dicey to try and master SEO if you're not on the top of your game. So let me get back to the original question about on page. Well, real, 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 yeah. real quick, um, um, Stella, can you describe like what like some of those off-page signals are before we sure. like, get um, into the on-page stuff? So if somebody links to you, that's essentially like a vote, but not all votes are created equal. So a link from CNN.com is going to be worth a lot more than a link from Jim Bob's personal homepage. So you're mm -hmm. looking for uh, quality links. And what do I mean by quality? They are uh, ideally relevant to your industry. They are important as far as Google's concerned, um, authoritative, and trusted. And then the placement of the links matters. So if it's a footer link, it's not as valuable as if it's in the main body of the page. If okay. it's a site-wide link, then it's not as valuable as a link that's just on the home page because it looks like there's some commercial relationship going on between you and the linking website. So mm -hmm. those are just a handful of, of link-related factors. Oh, and, of course, the anchor text that is used, the underlying words, uh, in other words, um, so click here is um, not great anchor text because those words get associated with your page instead of something that's relevant to your 
industry or, or um, product, right? Mm-hmm. And yet you don't want to go over the top with this and get really keyword stuffed links that look artificial, like a whole bunch of people linking to you with used car San Diego. When you have a car lot called Mr. Joe's car lot, it just does not look legit to Google and you'll get penalized for that. So it, it has to it has to look natural. It should be natural, not just look natural, because the machine learning algorithms are getting better and better at sniffing out the artificial stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So those are some link-related signals. Uh, oh, and also placement of other text near the link, right? So if there's um, good keyword-rich content that's valuable uh, near your link, the link that's pointing to your site, that's helpful if uh, there's a bunch of spammy stuff like other links to sites that are not reputable. Uh, things like uh, Viagra and payday loan type links are adjacent to the link to your site. That doesn't uh, look good. So hmm. lots of link-related signals. And then related to, let's say, your domain, how about the registration date, the age of the domain, how about the age of the website? So the domain and the website have two different uh, ages. You might have sat on that domain for 10 years and not launched anything on it, just might have been a parking page or not resolving. So the clock really starts when the website starts, um, not when the domain gets registered nearly as much. So you go into the uh, Wayback Machine, archive.org, and you see how old your site is. Um, other domain related signals be like uh, uh, the number of years that you've paid for for your registration, your domain registration. If it's only uh, a new domain and it's only been registered for a year, that doesn't look as legit as a domain that's 10 years old and then you've registered it for the next um, 10 years or five years, or whatever. So that um, it looks like you're serious, you, you're not a fly by night. So those are some yeah. examples of domain-related signals. There are, are, are plenty others, and um, Matt Cutts once famously said, like, if, if um, whether the webmaster owned a cat or not uh, returned better search results, they, they would use that in the algorithm. So they're constantly testing all sorts of different um, signals to see if they improve the search results or detract from them. Gotcha. So it's an ever-moving target. Lots and lots and lots of stuff to consider. Now, I um, I, I actually came across a conversation the other day, and it was an SEO company, and they were, you know, kind of looking to place a value on like one of those super duper high quality linkbacks, like from a CNN or, or some other Forbes and some other big ones. Could, is there like a value, like approximate value placed on something like that? Well, the way that you would measure the value of it, not monetary value, but the amount of juice, basically, that's being transferred through that link is, uh, and this is a an approximation because we don't have access to the Google algorithm and the, the, the page rank scores, the real ones, the internal ones, we used to get page rank scores through the Google toolbar that were kind of a joke. <laughs> we all knew inside the SEO community not to pay attention to those. But the real page rank algorithm and, and scores, we don't have any in, um, insight into. It's all hidden within the Googleplex. We can use some different tools that approximate page rank, such as um, uh, well, there's Open Site Explorer from Moz and their metrics uh, for determining kind of or estimating the page rank score include MozRank and uh, page authority and domain authority. They also have Moz Trust, which, which approximates uh, trust rank, which we can talk about uh, if you'd like, but it's, it gets a little geeky. Um, there is also Majestic.com, which is a tool that is um, – uh, running a, a different algorithm and uh, has a different crawl of the web. So it's, I, I believe in looking for corroborating evidence. Use multiple tools. Use mm-hmm. Open Site Explorer and use Majestic to see if mm-hmm. a trend or um, some some uh, uh, data point is is real. Uh, so Majestic's two metrics to pay attention to are citation flow, 
which is their approximation page rank, and trust flow, or their approximation of trust rank. And then there's um, a hrefs.com, and there's linkresearchtools.com. Uh, oh, Link Research Tools, uh, they have uh, Kemper, um, uh, Kemper Power, Kemper Trust, and Kemper Power Trust. So there's a lot of different tools that you could use that would estimate PageRank. I, I use all of them, but at least have two that you um, use regularly. And some of these tools you can still put in a website, even if you don't, no, you put in the URL. Even if you haven't logged in, you'll get maybe three uh, queries a day allowed. So it's best if you just pay for the service, but even if you don't have the budget at the moment, you can get some value out of these tools. Uh, it's just so not it, nearly as much. Is there any way to put a monetary value on if somebody, if an SEO company was coming to somebody and say, hey, we're going to get you a link back from this, this, this high-quality no. site? No, in fact, in fact, I would say that's folly. Uh, to, <clears throat> to put monetary value, um, you, you can't possibly do that because once you look at an individual link and the score might check out, but then uh, you see that a bunch of the links on the page are really sketchy. Links to Viagra, payday loan, yeah. you know, all these really sketchy uh, links that completely invalidates the power of the link that um, you have no, on that I page. I hear you. I hear you. And then that's that's where I just was like wondering. I was like, how can they do this? It really just comes down to, I mean, you got to get with if you're going to be concentrating on your. Um, you know, like an SEO company, you know, that's going to be getting you, you know, link juice. Uh, it really just comes down to the repu reputable companies, and you got to find a good company because there's just, there's so many things that you can fool somebody with. It sounds like e even if it's saying hey, you're getting yeah. it from a Forbes.com, what what that might not mean what it used to mean, or it doesn't mean what it oh, used to mean. Definitely. And, and, it definitely and, and, doesn't mean. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, well, that, that, that's so interesting. The, I, I kind of felt that, but I didn't know it, you know. I just like, just thought that it sounded weird. Yeah, so here's the thing that I would recommend you do to make sure you're, you're getting a good SEO firm. I have two different documents uh, that are free on my website on stephanspencer.com. One is in the, in the resources, guides, and white paper section. So mouse over resources and then pick guides and white papers. The first document is an SEO hiring blueprint, and the second one is an SEO BS detector. I won't say the, huh. what BS stands for. Love it. Love <laughs> but you know it. what Love it means. It. Uh, this is a clean <laughs> podcast, right? The idea here, though, uh, is you, know. you, you need a roadmap. <laughs> Maybe it's not a clean podcast. I don't know. Um, the, the, the roadmap that you get from that SEO hiring blueprint, you just follow it to ensure that you get a uh, really qualified candidates, whether they're in-house uh, SEO people that you're looking to hire or they're an agency you're looking to hire or uh, a, a, an individual consultant like me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much an individual consultant. I have a uh, small team that helps support me in like running reports for my clients and um, so forth, but I'm doing uh, the, the bulk of the work. And then uh, uh, the second document, the SEO BS detector, has some trick questions in it. So one stage in the seven-stage process for uh, in, in my SEO hiring blueprint is to introduce trick questions in the, into the interview process. And mm -hmm. these are not obvious as trick questions. You're just asking things that you already know there's only one right answer to. And it just sounds like an innocent question that, Somebody might ask, like, uh, you might slip into the in, into the interview when you're asking about things like, okay, what's what's your process for uh, for doing on-page SEO? And I, I realize we never circle back to on-page stuff, but what, what's some of your your strategies and tactics for on-page stuff for optimizing things on the mm -hmm. page, like titles and so forth? And and then you might slip in as the trick question, and and tell me what the process is for optimizing meta keywords. How does that work? And, and the only right answer is meta keywords. Are you serious? Uh, no, the, those you know those never counted in Google. That's the only right answer. Because if they said, well, they don't count as much as they used to, but it's not a, an, uh, it's not a bad thing to do it still, 
that's a completely bogus answer because they never counted in Google. And if you don't believe me, just Google it. Type in uh, – this is on the Google Webmaster Central blog back in 2009 or something. They said, we never counted meta keywords in our algorithm. Mm -hmm. They never counted. They were never a positive ranking signal. So if somebody says – Anything to the contrary, you know they don't know their stuff, and that's a great uh, time to say, you know, um, we're, we're done with the interview, but I appreciate your time. Here's the door. Yeah. So you well, got to be you, very careful. You're just telling people about those just save people probably a ton of grief and, and, and money and time. So that, I, I'm so happy to, to hear that you've come up with something like that because I think you're really doing some, you know, doing doing a service to the to the world and the industry out there. That that's awesome. Yeah, thank and, and you. Just thank to, you. Just, I, to, um, just to direct people correctly, it's stephanspencer.com. That's S T E P H A N S P E N C E R dot com. Stephon Spencer. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and there's All a right, ton yeah, of other awesome. stuff on there too. That uh, you know, like uh, probably hundreds. Of, not counted them all, but <laughs> probably hundreds of articles I've written for Search Engine Land for many years. Uh, so there are links to tons of those articles uh, written for multi-channel merchants and um, just a, a, a bunch of different sites, uh, Huffington Post, etc. And then uh, there are some other white papers and and downloadable PDFs, there's archived webinars and um, YouTube videos, interviews, all sorts of stuff. And I have two podcast shows that people should definitely check out. Like, there are links to both shows from stephanspencer.com, but you could go directly to marketingspeak.com for the Marketing Speak podcast, all about Internet marketing stuff like uh, uh, Facebook advertising, SEO, of course, um, uh, conversion optimization, you name it. And uh, I interviewed some really great guests. I interviewed Jay Abraham uh, recently, for example, on Marketing Speak. And then the other one is called The Optimized Geek. <laughs> kind of a funny name. Um, that's all about self-development and, and personal transformation, even though it sounds mm -hmm. like it's all about optimizing uh, like SEO. It's optimizing yourself. No, no, I've looked uh, at like, a couple of those. They're really good. Really oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I've got some great episodes on there, like Harville Hendricks, author of Getting the Love You Want. Uh, he's been on Oprah and stuff. Uh, Phil Town is uh, like one of the top financial gurus in the world. He wrote two number one New York Times bestsellers, and he's talking about how to invest in the stock market and not lose money. Uh, it's just like there's some great episodes, all these biohacking uh, episodes as well. I've got um, I'm going to interview Dave Asprey next month, uh, who's the uh, Bulletproof executive and uh, creator of Bulletproof um, Diet, which is a New York Times bestseller, and uh, Bulletproof Coffee is his invention. Yeah, great stuff. So check out those two podcasts as well. Awesome. Now, do, now, obviously, I think a lot of people are going to be running over there to learn learn a lot. But um, to kind of just dig into some of the, uh, just circling back to the original question, um, what, what are just some of the basics? Every company just getting started. Okay, here here are the two, four, five, ten things that you just need to do right away. What what would those be? For your yeah. So. One of the most important uh, things to look at on page is the title tag. It's the most important signal as far as the on-page signals. And, and, and it's not something that is oftentimes paid attention to if you don't know SEO. So a great way to see what your title tags look like <clears throat> is to type into Google, S-I-T-E colon, and then your domain dot com, so whatever your domain is. And so magnificent.com if you are David. So S I T E colon magnificent.com or Toyota.com or whatever your domain is. And then you're going to see a whole bunch of search results from your site and be up to like 700 and something uh, results. And um, you're going to just kind of scan through those to see how good those are. If they have good keyword phrases, if they are compelling, that they compel the click or if they're just pretty much useless, welcome to our website, untitled document. Those would be really lousy title tags. Um, and 
chances are you probably don't have fantastic title tags. So that's the first thing that you'd want to fix across your site. If you have a large site, then you're going to want to just start with the top of the site tree, your home page, secondary level pages, then move on to the tertiary level pages, and then quaternary level pages, and go as far as you can with the time that you have available. That's going to be a great return on investment of on-page stuff. There are a lot of other well, things that, that you again, could spend Stephon? your time What was it again? Site? You, you do your site. S I T E colon and then domain dot com, whatever that domain is, whatever your website gotcha. URL is. Okay. Don't put a space after the colon because that'll break the operator and it won't it won't it won't work right. So S I T E colon magnificent dot com for you guys would okay. return a whole bunch of pages from the magnificent dot com website. And then you just scan mm -hmm. through looking at those and you say, Oh yeah, these look really bad. I need to work on these. And if you're running a WordPress based website, you could either use a plugin that I had uh created back over five years ago. Uh and it's called SEO Title Tag, allows you to mass edit all sorts of um Posts, pages, tag pages, category pages, pretty much anything on your WordPress site, all through a mass edit interface, like dozens or hundreds of, of pages at a time without going to each page individually, uh, editing it, saving it, and then going back and then doing it to the next one. You want it all on one page, so that's, that's a mass edit interface. Or Yoast, um, uh, with their SEO plugin, <laughs> basically copied that functionality um, and put it into their plugin as well. So um, if you're using Yoast, you can just um, use that feature. And then you can just go through a whole bunch of pages, posts, and and, and so forth. And what are you looking for quickly. when you're going through these pages? I'm just doing it right now as we're doing it. So what are you what are we looking for? You right, looking so for the descriptions that that's underneath the the pages, or what exactly should one you know be paying attention to? It, it, well, the most important thing is the. Uh, is the title, and then the meta description is not uh, something that influences your search rankings in Google, so you're not going to worry about that. Um, that's a second order activity if you have extra time. Work on the things that are really uh, a, a good use of your time, so the, that will move the needle, right? So mm -hmm. if I were to put in, I'll put it in right now, it's like colon magnificent.com, and I'll Pick an example of uh, one of you your pages. Harsh. You can be harsh. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, directory listings, Mag magnificent marketing LLC. Well, um, are you, uh, if you're trying to rank for directory listings, that um, is okay, but that doesn't I, I, that doesn't compel me to click for one thing. If I saw that in the search results, I would have zero interest in clicking on that. And secondly, you got to think about what are the keywords that you really want to rank for. Directory listings, that's not really a good keyword anymore. Back 10 years ago when uh, people were still talking about getting directory listings uh, for SEO, um, that might have been useful as far as a, a title tag. Um, another example is your team, Magnificent Marketing LLC. Well, is it uh, what kind of team? Is it uh, your your team of marketing specialists at Magnificent would be a better title tag if you're trying to rank for uh, a marketing related keyword or so you, sales, marketing strategy, branding. These are all keywords that you guys probably want to rank for and you've got special uh, specialization expertise in, none of those keywords are represented in the title tag. It just says your team, Magnificent Marketing LLC. So the marketing is in there, I guess, what is part of your name, but that's a boilerplate in every single one of your titles. It's just your company name. Uh, it's not it's not as good as having a keyword-rich phrase, but remember Google now is smarter than they were Ten years ago, it's not about the exact match phrase. It's about entities and uh, you know, other corroborating signals that help Google figure out, yeah, you really are marketing experts or strategy experts. But the title tag is a great place to start. And you're looking at, like, what actually the top 
part of it right there, like your team dash content technology plus marketing services, correct? The um, oh, and that's another good point. Uh, if if Google is using a um, title that is different from your title tag, that means that they've overridden your title for whatever reason. Perhaps it looks to keyword stuff. So actually, that's a good point. I didn't go to the page itself. I just saw the title that Google was displaying. They overrode your um, your title tag. So says, according to Google, your team, Magnificent Marketing LLC, I click and then I see that your title is actually different and this is happening more and more these days. You guys have a title that says your team, Content Technology and Marketing Services, Austin, Texas. So if Google is basically hijacking your title, try kind of making it more value added, less keyword stuffed, and uh, uh, seeing if, if Google will start using your title instead because um, it's, it's hard to know why exactly Google is overriding uh, your title tag with theirs. But uh, you, you don't want to just accept that. <laughs> you want to work to improve your title until yours is the one that gets represented in the search results. So that's a that's a good point that I didn't uh, um, I didn't make until you you, you brought it up. So yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Um, all right. What well, what what are some other things? I mean, that's great great starting point there. Uh, what are some other just the basics? You know, right you know right away before digging into all the minutia, uh, what, what are some of the other things people just checklist of, um, you know, do this, 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 and this? Yeah, so it, this is going to get, it's going to start to get geeky. Um, we'll start with the easy stuff. So the title tag, really easy. Um, of course, you want to do some keyword research, use like the Google AdWords Keyword Planner. You need an uh, AdWords account in order to use the tool, but you don't have to spend money with AdWords. You just have to sign up and give your credit card details and then you can start using the tool. It won't be dinging your credit card. Just don't start any campaigns that you didn't mean to uh, in, in AdWords. So once you've identified some good keywords to target and you've uh, incorporated some of those into the appropriate pages on the site, you're not going to keyword stuff. You're not going to use the same keyword phrase across all pages of your site. You're going to pick a page that's highly relevant to that keyword theme, and then you're going to um, put that into the title. You're going to uh, also put that in the body copy. And the, the concept of keyword prominence is important to grasp here because it's not about the number of occurrences, otherwise known as keyword density. It's about the, the placement of that keyword phrase. So if it's at the top of the page, it's worth more than if it's at the bottom of a 3,000-word page. So just think about, like, am I um, putting my best foot forward here with this uh, page in terms of what I'm trying to present as my keyword focus or keyword theme? And so keyword prominence is a really important concept for that. And now we're going to get geeky because you're going to have to think about what's happening behind the scenes in the HTML, such as schema.org markup. That's also known as microdata markup. You uh, make sure, like, if you have a video embedded on the page, that you're using a schema.org video object or Facebook share format or RDFA. Um, so you got, you know, geeky stuff going on behind the scenes, depending on what kind of page type we're talking about. If it's a product page, then you've got offer markup schema.org offer markup and so forth because you want some rich snippets to appear in the search results for your listings, right? You want, for example, if you have um, uh, customer reviews, you want a star rating in your listing in Google. You want it to say the number of reviews that are um, associated with that product page. Um, if you have um, stock availability on your page, in stock or out of stock, you want that displayed in the Google listing. You you want your pricing. If, if um, the, the product is $32, you want that to show up in, in the search result. So that's all done with schema.org markup. And um, uh, that, that's something that 
if you're not sure that you're doing it or not, you could use a tool called the Stru Google Structured Data Testing Tool to see if this is in place and if it's in place correctly. And then there's other stuff that you're going to have to, configuration type stuff that you're going to need to watch out for. Things like, uh, is there a meta robots tag uh, that's uh, a no index directive that's causing that page not to show up in the search results or uh, the robots.txt disallow directive blocking that page from being spidered by Google. Uh, yeah, there's tons of things to look out for. Um, just configuration-wise, you want to make sure that your error pages are working properly, returning a 404 if it's a 404 um, type of page. You want a 404 status code return, so you're going to have to use a server header checker to test that. And there are a bunch of free ones online. Just Google it, server header checker. Put in a URL of a page that shouldn't exist, like magnificent.com slash ASDF, ASDF. Right, something nonsensical like that from your site, mm -hmm. and make sure that the server header checker returns a 404 status code. It's not good enough that the page says, oops, nothing here, sorry, and, and you know, nice, pretty-looking uh, custom error page. It actually has to return a 404 status code. So I could go on and on with uh, hours and hours of all sorts of geeky configuration things that you need to do, like if you have a mobile site and if you blah, 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 blah. But I know we have only limited time in our episode, mm -hmm. so uh, that's sure. probably a, a, a good starting point. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Personally, too. We're going to be re-listening to this and going back and applying all this stuff and then heading over to your site and, and uh, learning from you there as well. Okay, uh, mo moving on a little bit. I, I know there's um, a lot of, a ton of confusion in the marketplace these days on, you know, link backs. You know, you have, you know, you have your traditional, you know, you know, SEO companies that say it's all about links. It's all about links. And at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, you know, with the social signals and, you know, everything else in play on pay, you know, on your dwell time on the side, how long people stay on the page and all that plays into factors. But you, you still do have, you know, I mean, I get emails daily with SEO companies talking about link backs, right? And so I would just like for you to explain how this works in, in today's world. Um, you know, you know, you could toe the line between gray and black hat with, with people saying, I'm going to build links for you. So can you talk about how important, you know, this kind of stuff is still, you know, important for traffic and rankings and everything versus, you know, what, what, is, what is somebody, what is a good SEO company really should be doing for you in regards to, you know, the talk of links? Right. So um, if you think about this as kind of like a, a, a commodity type situation, you're getting it all wrong. It's not about getting a certain number of links with certain metrics associated with those links, like MozRank or domain authority, page authority of the linking site or page. That's not a, a useful way to think about it. Mm -hmm. It's much better to consider. And, and I'll preface this by saying that links are still the most important signal in the Google algorithm. According to a Google engineer, the three most important signals, and this has uh, recently been circulating around uh, SEO news sites like Search Engine Land and you know, SEM Post, the, the, the three things are links, content, and rank brain. Those are the three most important signals that Google uses. Rank brain. And links is at the, yeah, rank brain is the machine learning algorithm we talked about uh, just a little okay. bit ago. Okay. Okay. So those are the three things. And there are plenty of other signals, hundreds of other signals, but those are the top three links at the very top of the list. So this is important. We can't just uh, n not worry about it, expect it to take care of itself. But to think of this as a commodity would be a big mistake. So it's about being remarkable with your online marketing and as a way to get the attention of influencers, the linkerati, in other words, who will link to you from their blogs and websites that have lots of authority, trust, and importance in the eyes of Google, and that's where you get all that juice. If how, you how does one go are, about getting that? 
how, how do you go about like being remarkable and then getting all those yep. great links? Um, mm -hmm. First of all, you have to think differently about what you're creating, whether it's um, – it doesn't matter what your industry is. It could be as boring as you're selling toilet seat lids or you know, plumbing supplies. It doesn't matter because you can still think outside the box and come up with crazy brilliant ideas for uh, content marketing pieces, right? So if I were selling plumbing supplies, I might think of um, – a, a compilation type blog post of the 50 craziest urinals from around the world and all I have to do, I don't have to go travel the world and take pictures, I just go on to Flickr and Google Images and so forth and just type in the word urinal and find the best um, images that are Creative Commons licensed that I can reuse those and then create a compilation blog post of funniest, craziest urinals, and now I have a tangentially related uh, to my business blog post that has potentially viral appeal. And I'm mm -hmm. just going to keep doing this and upping my game and getting better at this as time goes on. So I might start doing, um, instead of just listicles, I might then move on to doing infographics and use a free tool like, uh, or inexpensive tool like Pictochart to create infographics, or I might get my graphic designer to create infographics for me. Uh, I might mm -hmm. create personality tests or quizzes. And so um, there's so many things that you could do, uh, checklists, worksheets, buyer's guides, how-tos, uh, comics, viral videos, you name it, that mm -hmm. would potentially be remarkable if you um, think of uh, a, a clever hook or angle and then you pay mm -hmm. attention to the headline a really killer headline is going to be critical. And you've probably seen in your Facebook news feed the, uh, the personality test, which city should you actually live in? And that did really well. It spread virally. Um, and by the way, the social signals are not what we're after. We're after the links because social signals are not in those three things, right? Uh, it's not a signal that Google is paying a lot of attention to. The the shares and retweets and likes and plus ones and, and the, all that. That's not the end game. The end game is the links because we're spreading virally through social media, getting the attention of the linkerati, and they're like, oh, that is so cool. i got to write about that on my blog. Gotcha. So that, that's the gotcha. end game. And, and if we've got a really killer headline, like which city should you actually live in, and you notice that the word actually just, made that headline, right? What city should you live in quiz doesn't do it at all. It's just a, another Me Too type of mm -hmm. survey. And that actually presupposes that you're not living in the city that best suits you. And so that, that pay attention to the headline. So you can repackage your idea, your the, the hook that you've come up with, into different formats, right? So let's say that you have this idea for uh, an infographic about um, the different hand gestures and what they mean in different parts of the world. Some things don't mean nice things uh, depending on the country you're in, like an okay is not okay or a thumbs up means up yours <laughs> depending on which country <laughs> you're in. So an infographic would be a great starting point for conveying that information. It would be a lot of fun, right? And, mm -hmm. and graphical. You could also use a viral video that would be a lot of fun and you're like, oh, well, I'm not going to send a video team around the world to take videos of, of uh, what these things mean in different parts of the world. Well, just go on to Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, pay somebody five bucks in that country to go and video themselves given the, the thumbs up or whatever, you know, the, the up yours or whatever that means <laughs> in that country and see what the reactions are and then take the best of those videos and create a compilation, add your narration and say, you know, add some, um, some animation and stuff to it and have an educational viral video about uh, what these different hand gestures mean in different parts of the world and how to avoid getting shot. And, and you could just keep repackaging these things in different formats, like a personality test or quiz. Like you can have a quiz, which uh, will you get shot 
as a world traveler, yes or no, uh, take the quiz. And then you uh, try and guess whether this thing is an okay thing to, to do as a hand gesture, like the V for victory uh, signal is very vulgar <laughs> in certain countries. And you wouldn't know necessarily which countries you can use it and not use it, and you can have this fun quiz, and then it gives you a score at the end, and then there's a badge that you can probably display on your social media profile or your blog sidebar saying whether you get shot or not uh, as a world traveler or what, you know, how, how many mm -hmm. uh, bullet wounds you get, whatever, right? So I'm just making yeah. this up, but the yeah. idea here is think differently, think outside the box, create something that has the potentially a viral appeal, even if it's just tangentially related, that's okay. This is not designed for your customers. This is designed for the Linkerati, right? So just like uh, Caterpillar, Cat, the, uh, they make big you know, earth-moving machines. They made this incredible viral video, massive Jenga game. The Jenga using, game, yeah. Using huge, uh, like, ton, uh, uh, one-ton blocks mm -hmm. and earth-moving equipment to create the, the Jenga tower, and uh, that got millions of views. And then they eventually got the links by having uh, various blog posts and, and PR initiatives. It wasn't just to get links to the YouTube video on YouTube.com because that doesn't help them uh, directly. They want the links to their website. And they got it. They got lots of great links, and that was not targeting the customers at all. Nobody's going to say, oh, I'm so glad I watched that video. Now I'm definitely <laughs> going to buy that uh, that bulldozer. Yeah, I want to buy right. that game. So, yeah. yeah, so it sounds like more and more with SEO, content marketing is um, becoming a bigger factor for small and large companies, it sounds like, um, you yeah. know, to, uh, to get these link backs. But then you just need to I, – I always – say before we invite guests over you got to get your house in order so make sure you get all that on page stuff done that you mentioned and you know you and listeners again can go to stuff on spencer.com to uh to get all that stuff done so that's that's first and foremost but then the plan moving forward it's less about trying to like build links and instead it's create you know super compelling content that's you know, everything you've described above. It could be funny, it could be humorous, it could be, you know, educational, it could just be just crazy off the cuff stuff. But yeah, so it sounds like that that's kind of the winning formula. Get everything on, on your site done correctly and then be remarkable with, with your content and get it out there to get these links back. Is it, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, and people are probably going to wonder, well, how the heck do I get it out there? I have very few fans or followers or subscribers, and I can push it out on my social media channels. And it won't make a darn bit of difference. Mm -hmm. So the solution there is to use power users. I wrote an article for Search Engine Land a while ago um, called The Social Media Underground, and that goes through how to get uh, power users in your hip pocket to utilize for pushing out your remarkable content into various social channels and get that kind of reach and and uh, hopefully the, the snowball effect will happen, right? It'll, the snowball starts small uh, rolling down the hill, but it gets big um, and gets really big fast. So uh, and, that's and the idea. Power users, what, what else would you suggest? You know, obviously that'll take some time and, and to try to do that. What, what, are, what are some other you know, getting in and getting it out there. Suggestions do you have? Yeah, to network with um, with influencers. Let's say if you're a podcaster, you want to go to podcasting conferences and meet the top podcasters and and add value first. Ask for favors later. So, uh, podcast movement is coming up in uh, July in Chicago. Podfest just happened in Florida. Uh, so. Go to conferences, make friends, uh, go to meetups and things where you're going to meet other influencers, not just random meetups, but ones where uh, influencers hang out at. And uh, use a tool that allows you to outreach to influencers and, and build those prospect lists of influencers who have high cloud scores, high Moz rank scores, et cetera. Like pitchbox.com is a great tool uh, for that. Not only does it do the prospecting and build the list for you of influencers per the topic that you're 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 working on, uh, so you put in keywords and then it 
builds that list for you, but also it will do the outreach for you. You, you pick some templates or you upload your own templates, and then you can personalize the individual emails. Um, it also works like a mail merge sort of thing, but it's got to seem like it's an individually handcrafted email and not one of those um, bulk emails because that will get deleted immediately. And then it, it handles the follow-up. If they didn't respond after 10 days or two weeks, then you want to send them a, a follow-up. So you can have a template for that and re-forward the original email, but ask for um, uh, add value before you ask for a favor. So mm -hmm. if you have a column with the Huffington Post, like I do, you could say, well, I'm working on an article of, um, you know, 15 things that counterintuitive things about marketing that uh, you need to know, and I wanted to interview you for that article or get at least a, a, a short quote or, or tip. Can, can I interview via email or, or by Skype? for you know five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. And and that's a great way to add value first and then build the relationship so that you can ask for the favor later, like, hey, I'm working on this ebook or whatever and I'd love for your uh your your subscribers or your readers to you know have access to this for free. You don't start with that. You don't walk up to a woman and say, hey, nice to meet you. Would you like to get married? That's really creepy. You mm -hmm. add value first. You start, um, you know, with a, 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 a low-impact thing, and you kind of, um, w over time, build up to the ask. So, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's all amazing stuff, Stefan. I just can't thank you enough for sharing that. Um, that, that that's amazing. And again, uh, you know, everybody can go back to your site to, to learn learn more about um, you know all, all the specifics of everything. Um, to uh, kind of close, but move on. Um, wanted to maybe just ask some some specific questions. I, I came across just doing some research, getting ready for this podcast, and just kind of ha have you answer some specifics here that that uh, just circling to end, but circling back around to on page stuff. Um, some things I'm just very curious about as well. Um, one uh, came across a question of, uh, do you think uh, bolding your keywords gives your page an SEO boost? Is that a misnomer? Is that true? Is that false? Yeah, it's completely false. And okay. uh, uh, if that's the sort of uh, mythology that you're getting, uh, you need to run from that SEO who's telling you that stuff. Cause it, it was, it's an, actually an SEO. I won't mention the person's name or anything. It's this email that I, I, um, I'm I just on their list, and I get it. And I thought these were some odd questions, so I wanted to run uh, them by you. There's and again, a lot this goes of to that BS. Yeah, I know, and that, that's, what's just, that's what's so curious about this topic. I mean, of, of all marketing, I would say this is the most fuzzy – um, understanding from people in the marketing world and the, for sure the business world because SEO, what does it even mean anymore these days almost it feels like. you know. So I, I came across these questions from them and I've always had a, a raised eyebrow from them and I haven't, mis I haven't unfollowed them or, or unsubscribed because I'm always so curious because they're such an old school company. Um, but th that's why I was just – I just wanted to bring these questions to you because – I thought that they were great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, I mean, great, great in the sense of, are they real, right? So, yeah, they're entertaining. Uh, it's definitely yeah. entertaining. And, and by the way, all these sorts of myths, uh, there's a bunch of them I've collected and, and debunked in a, a white paper, like my mini ebook. Again, free document on my website on stephanspencer.com in the same area. Uh, resources and then guides and white papers. It's called These SEO Myths Must Die, and I list 72 uh, myths like that and then debunk each one of them one by one. Well, I will definitely link to that you know, when I write up this uh, blog post because <laughs> I, I, I will link to it and I will read it through every single one because that's what we're trying to clear up today. And I think you're, you're doing a marvelous job at it and not to mention, you know, all the resources that will do that. So just, just a few more questions here just, just out of curiosity. Um, are visits like to a website or page alone a ranking factor at all? Uh, no, if you think about like – um, so Google's not hacking your Google Analytics or using that data. They're not um, 
and they're not watching your user behavior once they're on your site. What they do see is the click-through from the search results. So if somebody comes back to the search results after being to your site for only a second and then picks the next search result, that's an indicator that you did not answer their question or serve their need. So that's what you're looking for. It's not in the Google Analytics uh, reports of so time on site and bounce rate and all that sort of stuff. In fact, many of those metrics are um, not useful metrics. They're, they're not actionable. They are uh, a waste of time in many senses, and, and yet people keep talking about them um, and, and as if they're valuable and, and, and useful. I recently interviewed Jared Spool on the uh, on Marketing Speak, and he's a world class usability expert, right up there with Jacob Nielsen. And we had a whole discussion about metrics such as time on site, bounce rate, even conversion rate, and how these are just bunk. They're not the right kind of metrics to be basing your business decisions on. So uh, we talked about how to get um, a better handle on user frustration and delight with different kinds of metrics, and that's a must-listen-to episode. So the, the bottom line here is um, focus on the metrics that matter, that are more related to user delight, user frustration, and not these other metrics that are the, the, the default metrics that you get from uh, Google Analytics, because those aren't the ones that really are going to move the needle for your business if you work to improve them. And uh, most of those aren't even used in the Google algorithm either, right? So just think about what Google sees, sees the click um, from the search results, and uh, then it can see if the user comes back and clicks somewhere else. So try and add value. And it might be that adding value is answering their question quickly and so they don't spend a lot of time digging around on the page trying to find your answer. If it's a short mm -hmm. uh, answer, get them in and out and realize that Google over time is going to understand that it's not for that kind of query about the time on the page, it's about answering the question quickly, and you did it. Their machine learning algorithms will figure that out and reward you for that, even though they spent only a few seconds on your page to get the answer, and then they left. They didn't end up okay. clicking on another listing to get the answer, and uh, Rank Brain goes in there and sees that uh, it, it basically interprets. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, kind of hypothesizing into the future that they're going to be able to do a, a heck of a lot more in, in terms of the artificial intelligence, but to be able to ascertain that the question was answered correctly and uh, effectively on your page versus um, just looking at uh, other signals that, that um, point in that direction that probably the question was answered. Now, Google's going to be able to have artificial intelligence that knows you answered the question. As, uh, computers are going to be smarter than us, yeah. and it's in our lifetimes. So it's, like, yeah, scary. And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is, but um, a little bit what's comforting with Google and, and Facebook and some of these, you know, quote, unquote, big bag giants, and I'm doing air quotes, is that they really um, – their businesses are based around um, user experience, really. You know, I mean, yeah, they're they're in to make money, but they can't make money if they have a faulty product. So they're they're really in it to get you know get on all, all the crappy ways of doing things and the manipulative ways of doing things, and they're in it for making sure that what the users are expressing is the best way is the way Google and Facebook and everybody is turning. So um, yeah. if you just pay attention to to that. You know that will lead naturally a lot, but if you got to pay attention to the details and you know everything we've discussed and and everything that you know there's still a lot to be looked into um, through a lot of your uh, resources. But in general, though, um, they're doing the, us a service, and and um, and I like them for it. Um, yeah. So one last question that I, I it comes up a lot, at least I hear it a lot. Um, domain extensions, do they mean anything? Is there you know do dot coms work? good, I mean, the best, or, you know, the, you have all these new extensions coming out, do, do they play a factor at all? 
It's not about the domain extension. You're not trying to get links from .edu's and and .gov's because of the extension. For example, you're what matters is the link profile, the, the link neighborhood that site is in. Uh, okay. .edu's and .gov's tend to be better uh, links pointing to your site because they have more pristine link neighborhoods. A .gov doesn't have um, a lot of spammers hacking the site and, and getting or getting otherwise getting access to the site and dropping all their spammy links. So they're more trusted. They're in a more trusted neighborhood. Uh, but it's just correlation, it's not causation. So but what if you were starting getting a site and you were doing getting a domain? Do you do .co, .com, .net? Um, dot does com, it dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. The okay. reason why is because that's what users expect. Yep. That's what. Um, okay. Th th there's this uh, uh, unspoken question that people have when they see anything other than a dot com. Like, is this legit? Is yeah. this is no, this okay. a real thing like a uh, a dot biz or a dot info or a dot mm -hmm. ninja or dot guru? Like people look at that and say, really? <laughs> okay, that's what I found. I mean, I did register. Gut, I no, yeah, yeah, I, I did register Stefan dot ninja for fun and Stefan dot guru, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not putting those on my business card. <laughs> so yeah. that's just kind of yeah. ridiculous. Get a dot gotcha. com, and if if any kind of permutation that you're looking for is already taken, um, just go to a, a aftermarket uh, domain resource like buydomains.com, B-U-Y, <laughs> like purchase, uh, buydomains.com or uh, hugedomains.com. Do some searches. Do some keyword searches. Find some domains that are in your budget range. They're, they've been around for a while. Most of the good domains, all neck, heck, all the good good domains are already taken. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. probably going to have to buy an aftermarket domain, and uh, you can buy them for as cheap as maybe 500 bucks, even a couple hundred bucks. I bought scienceofseo.com five years ago for uh, I think I paid 650 for that. I bought mm -hmm. uh, in instar.com, i n n s t a r.com. A site that's been around since the '90s for 500, yeah, 500 bucks. That's what I paid yeah. for that. So yeah. it, good deals are out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were lucky enough to score magnificent.com. <laughs> that was uh, kind of lucky. That, that is magnificent. Uh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, hey, Stephen, cannot thank you enough. Uh, not only to have created an amazingly content-rich um, and educational podcast and blog but uh, on a personal level um, you know you gave me, us a lot of marching orders for our team so we're, we're going to be digging into all this stuff so uh, thank you on both accounts and again just to reiterate uh, everybody can go to s-t-e-p-h-a-n-s-p-e-n-c-e-r dot com step on spencer dot com for all those resources uh, we've mentioned a couple of them that um, you specifically should go and, and look um, the starting starting guide stuff as well as some of the myths. Uh, just a lot of a lot of great information. So I highly encourage everybody to run over there and uh, keep learning from this guy because um, you know people probably say this kind of stuff a lot about a lot of people, but he truly is um, one of the very 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 best in the business. Or else people like um, Seth Rogen and. Um, uh, uh, Tony Shea wouldn't be using it. <laughs> so, Seven, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we look forward to uh, doing another one with you uh, with you soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks a lot.